Ethnobotany is a study of plants in relation to local culture and uses. These uses range from the integration of plants into religion, medicine, or food. Over three weeks, we studied this relationship at five different sites, all of which had unique aspects of the local use of the plants, demonstrating the strong knowledge and connection so many of these people have with their land. The medicinal properties of these diverse plants that we have learned about also attracted the interest and attention of the Western world, and now, much of Western medicine has its origins in Chinese medicine and ethnobotany. The quest for foreign and exotic garden plants began around the turn of the 20th century. Botanists such as Joseph Rock set off to distant lands to recover exotic species of plants which would later fill the gardens of Europeans and Americans. In Yunnan, eight species of botanical plants were of particular interest. Camellia, Azalea, Magnolia, Primrose, Orchid, Rough Gentian, Meconopus intergraphiola, and Lily. Many of the plants found were also used for medical purposes, such as the cure of leprosy. Early plant hunters sought cures, and only later did they set out to find garden specimens. Many Western medicines are derived from herbal medicines from around the world. This exploration was a product of empire. The European explorers believed the people of the Tibetan border regions to be kinder and easier to control than the Chinese. Also, since Tibet was on the very border regions of China, a distant and unsure part of their empire, many other countries viewed it as an area up for grabs, hence the botany project. It was also an important piece of a larger project. These European scientists wished to classify all the plants in the world, writing over their local names with their own European names. This was a kind of mapping that echoed other cartographies of empire. However, these plants already had names, purposes, and meanings in their local communities, whether they be medicinal, for aesthetic purposes, or spiritual. We will now go in depth about some of these meanings with information extracted from the locals themselves. Our first destination was the village of Hava. This area is home to many minority groups, including the E people, the Nashi people, Tibetan people, as well as a Muslim community. On our first day, we visit a vitally important holy spring in a virgin forest. This spring is worshipped by all the different groups in the area. The Nashi view springs and trees as especially sacred and even build family shrines beneath trees. The relationship between the Nashi and nature is one of reciprocity, so the Nashi abstain from cutting down trees. This is because they believe in shoe spirits, which are snake spirits that become offended when people take from nature. On the second day, our host Bao Daga led us on a long, fun hike where he graciously shared his knowledge of the local ethnobotany with us by pointing out lots of native plants and explaining their local use. First, he taught us about the song tzu zong, a type of pine tree in which a hole can be made to extract the sap. When fresh, the sap can be used to heal cuts. It can also be collected and made into song jie yo, or loosened joint oil, which can help treat arthritis. Further up the mountain, we all had an opportunity to try shaji, a sour yellow berry which can be made into a lemonade-like drink, or the leaves can be used to make tea. Both of these drinks have antioxidant and anti-carcinogen properties. We also saw ferns whose curly early shoots can be collected, cooked, and eaten, and we frequently ate them in shijo as well. Later on, we saw three yi women who were collecting morals, a type of mushroom that grows in high altitudes and is considered a delicacy. Along the way, we also saw wild huajiao trees, which are grown in Baodaga's garden as well. We were able to try the leaves of the huajiao that are typically hand-picked and used in cooking, such as scrambled eggs, but are expensive because of all the work that is needed to pick them one by one. The berries are also collected and used in cooking for their spice, and an oil can be made from them as well. Moreover, when I asked about some small red berries growing, Bao Da Ge told me they were called Cho Ching Cao and are good for cramps. I was struck by this quick response and his ability to identify the native plants and uses so deftly, which is something you would never see in DC, that's for sure. On our third day in Haba, we looked at medicinal and edible plants around the village area. After talking with Bao Da Ge, the owner of the lodge where we were staying, about his grandfather's books on herbal medicine. These plant books were from the Maoist era, when many young, educated people became barefoot doctors, going to remote villages to teach the locals about medicinal plants. The books, which contain Maoist slogans, include a vast variety of plant descriptions, including drawings, physical descriptions, what they are used for, and the Latin names. He outlined a number of his favorite plants, many of which he then showed us around Haba. 
But perhaps the most interesting thing was his relationship with the book. It had clearly been used numerous times over the past years, and he could quickly flip to the pages he was looking for. Additionally, he expressed that whenever he or someone in his family gets sick, he looks up a plant in one of the books and simply goes to find it on the mountain. The books in the area around him are all he needs, and as the years have gone by, he has built up impressive knowledge. After showing us his grandfather's book, Bao Daga took us to his garden where he first showed us some chong lo that he is growing and is used for arthritis and bruising. It is very expensive and for just a small area of land, Bao Daga makes 1,700 yuan. Unfortunately, it is becoming less and less popular in the market. Outside of the guest house, Bao Daga showed us a plant that he said was known as Damu Tong, which is used as a diuretic. We were then shown Suan Jian Cao, a medicinal plant that is used for diarrhea, lower back pain, and putting one's yin ji and yang ji in balance. Also, as Sarah points out, you can also choose to the thirst quencher. Oh yeah! <laughs> Next, he showed us some wild cotton, which is used for arthritis, getting rid of worms, and treating post-birth wound pain. We also learned about a plant called masang, which produces a yellow strawberry-like fruit in July. But watch out, because they are known for their poisonous seeds. Next, we were shown san ke jen, a plant that is used to maintain internal heat. Further into the forest, we saw tall yew trees, and Bao Daga told us about their bark, which is used for its powerful anti carcinogen properties. So because the bark of the yew tree is so valuable, someone came in the middle of the night and stripped this entire tree of its bark, and therefore it killed it. Another type of tree we saw was the walnut tree, whose seeds are very nutritious and eaten by humans, as well as squirrels and other forest animals. Uh, you need to cook it? Yeah. Does it have um does it have medical properties? Mm. Afterwards, we saw some Qing Si Guo, whose purple berries are popular ingredients in facial care products, especially in Korea. Back at the guest house, Bao Da Ge showed us a medicinal plant called Tian Ma, which he collects and sells for 480 yuan per jin. The powder of the Tian Ma can be put into chicken soup to treat vertigo. Hello, here we have some honeysuckle growing over the ivy. These have a very important medicinal use because little shoots can be put into tea and used as a powerful antibiotic. Thank you. We are very grateful for Bao Da Ge's willingness to share his great knowledge of the ethnobotany of Haba with us, and we sure learned a lot. Our second stop was Niru, a small Tibetan village. In Niru, they have many of the same plants that we saw in Haba. They have Qingqi Guo. We also found lots of Huajo, which the people of Niru use in ways similar to the ways in which the people of Haba use it. Both places have Longpi, or dragon skin. But unlike the people of Haba, our guide Amu told us that the villagers of Niru have never eaten it. They have wild cherry trees with sweet and sour varieties. Amu was easily able to differentiate between the two only by looking at them. This is sweet wild cherry. And over here, there is sour wild cherry. She also showed us a pear tree. The fact that Amu was so familiar with the plants around her illustrated the frequent use of the forest by the villagers of Miru. A car came to Niro for the first time only four years ago, and the village itself is surrounded by virgin forest due to its remote location and the minuscule cutting the Niro people have enacted on the forest. The village has no access to Western medicine, so they use the natural materials around them to cure any and all ailments. One important thing within Tibetan Buddhism is Tonka paintings, which traditionally depict Buddhist figures and scenes and are thought to imbibe qualities of the various Buddhas themselves. On our last day in Shangri-La, we spent the morning learning about and painting our own representation of Buddha in the Tonka style. These paintings are traditionally used in various places, such as the home. For example, in our host family's altar in Nishi, Tonka paintings, often concealed with cloths to protect them from weathering and fading, covered the walls. These paintings have to be drawn with immaculate proportions so as to fully represent the deities and make them recognizable. One of the most interesting things about these paintings, however, is what the paints are made out of. Varied natural things such as plants, 
corals, and interestingly, stones. Indeed, stones have a unique spiritual and healing importance within Tibetan culture. For example, in both Niru and Nishi, we witness the importance of white stones in shrines, money piles, and the entire landscape itself. In both Nishi and Felai Se, so, colorful polished stones were placed in front of representations of the Buddha. Our host in Nishi said that this was simply to offer beautiful things. Thus, while not plants, the use of stones is connected to the herbal medicine often found within Tibet and of a deep, holy, healing nature. In Shangri-La, we also learn about the importance of ethnobody in Tibetan Buddhism through the Medicine Buddha Temple, located on the top floor of our hotel. The Medicine Buddha is depicted with deep blue skin and holding a flowering medicinal plant known as Aruna. The Medicine Buddha represents Tibetan medicine and healing that is spiritual as well as physical, because there is an immense emphasis put on the connection between mental health and physical health in Tibetan Buddhism. The use of native plants is popular in this form of healing, as seen in the various samples of medicinal plants placed throughout the Tibetan map in the temple, signifying the importance of the plants and the landscape in Tibetan Buddhist healing. The map, as it is made of a circle within a square, also represents a view of the universe, showing the significance of herbal medicine in a large-scale view as well essentially of a residence of pharmaceutical cosmology present within the tradition. On our second day in Nishi, we went on a mushroom hunting hike up to a canyon. We saw many medicinal and fruit trees that we had seen in previous places, such as Hongjingtian, Songzisong, which was also in Haba, and the cherry tree, which we found in Niru. The biodiversity of Nishi, spurred on by the extreme mountainous landscape, harsh conditions, and the various resulting microclimates, is reflected in the medicinal herbs that grow there. Indeed, it is often referred to as the medicine house of China, due to the clean air, high diversity, and the extreme particular plants. However, it is interesting to note that, while there is a plentiful supply of herbs, the locals use very little. They have almost no need as they are so healthy. Instead, they sell most of the medicine they collect. It is essentially a cash crop. For example, one of the women leading us showed us peony on the sides of the road, and described how when they were young, as they had no ability to get a part-time job, they would gather the peony roots and sell them for medicine. The peonies are now a protected plant species. However, there are some plants that they use for themselves. For example, there is one plant she described that is used for stomach pain, while a plant known as Don Pea is used for inflammation of the throat. She also outlined how they used Maltau, or fuzzy peach, to feed to livestock. However, there's been much less Maltau in the recent years. She summed up these changes by describing how Twelve years ago, the residents dug out huge quantities of herbal medicine. However, it was bad for bodily health and people would get strange diseases. Essentially, they took so much medicine from the area that it affected the air and water quality, for the plants saturate the place. Thus, people would get sick more often. This also falls into the belief of a karmic response to taking things from nature. For in Nishi, each village has its own sacred mountain, and one cannot cut down trees off of the sacred mountain, or one will also get a strange illness. This is similar to the way in which the Nashi and Haba do not cut down trees in the sacred grove of the Holy Spring, and the woman in Niru made sure to put something back into nature for the fungi that was taken. In this way, the local belief fundamentally connects to science, promoting environmental and biological preservation. This is also likely a reason why the grandfather and our Nishi host family feels such great remorse about cutting down trees during the Cultural Revolution. Not only has he not left the beauty of his childhood to the next generation, but his generation violated the local beliefs around natural preservation. Nowadays, he wakes up every morning to burn boughs of cypress to the village's mountain god. We saw these same cypress boughs in a storage room at Felai Se. Our next stop was Tachung, a Lisu village. The Ta Chung area has a vast diversity of trees and wildlife. While there are small numbers of the individual kinds, there is great variety, with each species occupying a different altitude zone. Every year, the area records about two to three new species, thought to be moving higher in order to escape recent climate change. The reserve has a huge variety of mammals, birds, and butterflies, and also contains 119 villages scattered through the reserve. Interestingly, the villagers and the animal preservation effort coexist not despite each other, but perhaps because of each other. For the key element of this preservation effort is that of traditional culture. Like in previous places we encountered, the Tibetan and Lisu groups that inhabit the area have beliefs around the sanctity of life and preserving the local forests and plants. 
For example, in Lisu culture, each family maintains a specific hunting ground in a sustainable way. Thus, there is a particular emphasis on preserving light that we saw in connection to plants and other places as well. An indicator of this preservation of wildlife is the presence of the snub-nosed monkey, a first-class endangered species. In Tacheng, we were able to learn about how the monkeys self-medicate through using plants similarly to how our own species is able to use local plants for their medicinal properties. For example, they intentionally eat wild irises and rhododendrons, both of which are poisonous, to rid themselves of worms and regulate the large amount of bacteria in their stomachs used to digest the Spanish moss, which is the primary component of their diet. Another way in which these monkeys maintain their health is through frequently moving around so as to not contract parasitic diseases. Our last day in Tacheng, we hiked up to a nearby village where medicinal plants are grown and are the main source of income. These plants used to be harvested in the wild, but they are now grown in agricultural fields because of the high demand. Upon arriving, we saw Chuanwu growing, which can help heal cuts when put in alcohol and then apply to the skin of the injured area. This plant can also be boiled in water, made into a thick syrup, and put on the arrows that Lisu hunters would use to kill animals. For this plant, a farmer can earn 8 or 9,000 kwai per mu, and is a popular cash crop of the area. Another plant that is grown is the chingui. This is a family of plants that includes two variations, one of which can be grown anywhere and the other which can only be grown at high altitudes. The head of the plant is used as a blood builder, whereas the tail of it helps reduce blood flow, so combining the two creates a good tonic. It is also commonly eaten with guangji to achieve other medicinal properties. Combining medicinal plants is frequently seen in Chinese medicine and demonstrates an advanced knowledge of the medicinal properties of plants. Moreover, jiagen is grown in this village and its root can be eaten to reduce internal heat. One of the medicinal plants that is responsible for an important portion of the income of many villagers is cordycept, a plant that grows from the corpse of a bug that buries itself underground and has a myriad of medical uses like helping treat Lyme disease, immune system support, and can also be made into a tonic. Mushyang is also grown here. When this plant is boiled in water, the water can be drunken to help with breathing. It is also frequently made into a powder, and then liquid is added to shape balls which are also eaten for their medicinal properties. Additionally, Chuan Xian is grown, and the root is good to help reduce internal inflammation, and it can be combined with Huo Xiang Ye to help treat sore throats. Two familiar plants we saw were ferns that are eaten here as well, and the Chonglo, grown here as well as in Haba because it is an especially important medicinal plant in China, and is a key ingredient in Yunnan Bai Yao a very well-known Chinese medicine. It was fascinating to learn about the immense variety of plants local to these different villages and how the people have learned about their benefits. In our modern urban lives, it is easy to see this use and perspective of plants as a crucial medicine, as primitive or unsophisticated. But as we have learned, the vast knowledge of the specific uses of native plants is evidence of generations of wisdom being passed down and demonstrates a close connection many of these people have with the land. It is our hope that this knowledge continues being passed down and that the people continue to have such a strong understanding of the plants that surround them. Talk really Thank you so much for watching our video. We hope you learned a lot and we hope that you enjoyed watching it as much as we enjoyed making it. Thank you. No, but